quickly uh, introduce our speakers this morning and get right to the topic. Um, our, our first speaker is Dr. Wes Wilford. Wes recently completed his infectious disease fellowship here at UAB and is currently the medical director of disease control at the Jefferson County Department of Health, critically important public health partner for us here at the School of Public Health. We also have with us uh, this morning Dr. James Tang, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine, the Division of Infectious Diseases, and the Laboratory Director, the Program in Epidemiology of Infection and Immunity for the UAB Schools of Medicine and Public Health. And Dr. Tang actually has one of the labs up on the sixth floor. So if you have been wondering who is Dr. Tang with that lab up there, this is Dr. Tang. Before they get started, this is, this is my, um, my, my editorial comment or maybe trying to put this into perspective. 19 million cases, 180,000 hospitalizations, 10,000 deaths, including 68 children. Influenza. Thank you. I knew it would take an epidemiologist <laughs> to put it into perspective. That's influenza in the U.S. <coughs> this season. Okay? So I don't want to minimize the importance and um, the criticality of our knowing something about coronavirus, but I also want us to keep a balanced perspective on this as well. But with that, let's launch right into it. Sure. Dr. Wilford. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate it. And so, you know, this is a very exciting time in, in, in terms of a new disease. It's exciting and terrifying is perhaps a better way to, to, to talk about it. Um, so as we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with, started with this. As firstly, I have no disclosures uh, to, to speak of. Um, as far as objectives for this talk, I really want to really want to begin by talking about the importance of actually SARS in this, because SARS is what allowed us to be where we are today with regard to um, surveillance for this particular outbreak. Talk about the Chinese pneumonia of unknown etiology surveillance system to discuss uh, the 2019 coronavirus and the setting of uh, uh, commingling of humans and animals, and really to start to talk some of the important geographical um, uh, issues that's going on in the location of Wuhan, and we'll go over the epidemiology that we have thus far. So we'll kind of break it up, we'll start off talking about the SARS side of things. So well, SARS and coronaviruses. So in general, coronaviruses are a family of this uh, nidoviriales order. Um, they're typically divided into four different genres, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, the human coronaviruses tend to fall into the alpha and beta groups. Um, they're medium-sized, positive-stranded RNA viruses, and they kind of look like crowns, which let me show you the next picture. Um, and you can sort of see how that might look like a crown looking, uh, looking from the top down. Um, and actually, these, these, these uh, crowns are actually one of the, the antigenic um, areas that the body develops an immune response against the spike protein. Um, and that's actually, like I said, that, that's a lot of the immune response that we see. As far as distribution of these viruses, um, kind of a wide distribution, birds and mammals tend to be infected uh, with it. Uh, beta coronaviruses can cause a mouse-borne hepatitis, a bovine uh, or cattle can have uh, a diarrhea related to this virus. Uh, gamma coronaviruses tend to cause infections like a bronchitis in chickens, and delta coronaviruses often uh, affect songbirds in very adverse ways. So the human-acquired coronavirus is moving into sort of the a uh, little bit more of our realm. Uh, so there are at least four, four that are known prior to this. So there's this OC43229E that were discovered in the 1960s, um, and they cause as much as a third of upper respiratory tract infections um, during outbreaks in the winter, um, but then 5 to 10 percent in adults overall. Um, then we have the newer ones, this uh, NE63 and HKU1, that HK, HKU1 is actually the SARS virus. As far as the clinical manifestations go, they tend to cause symptoms very similar to the common rhinovirus, which causes much of our colds in, in, during, during the wintertime, um, usually having nasal congestion, some drippy nose. Um, in children, they can cause a middle ear effusion as well, and often can go on to cause a, an acute otitis media. So bringing the perspective to SARS and the kind of importance, there's a great review I found um, online, one of our messaging threads uh, in, in infectious diseases kind of gave this very, uh, very robust, detailed account of what happened with SARS. I mean, I've taken a few of the key points uh, from this summary. 
Um, so this started in 2002 uh, in southern China, where merchants and farmers uh, took wild mammals and native uh, in, from their native environments into this marketplace uh, with humans, brought them in very close contact with each other. The index case was thought to be on November 16, 2002, um, in the city of Fashan, and in mid-December, uh, by mid-December, it appeared in two additional cities uh, in the Guangdong province. Uh, so an expert team was dispatched by the Chinese Ministry of Health, um, and they went to the city of Zhongshan, and they began to investigate the outbreaks and determined that this was due to an atypical viral agent. Um, and what actually ended up being discovered was is actually a lot of hyper spreaders, or people who are, or, who are very good at producing the virus and spreading it to lots of different people. One of the events that happened in Hong Kong, there was this hot the Metropole Hotel um, that had a person who was actually a physician who was thought to be a hyper spreader, um, came through the hotel and was thought to have infected as many as 200 people. So a lot of these, these cases tend to, tend to spread out from these super spreaders. By the end of the SARS ep uh, epidemic, there was a total of 8,098 people who were infected with 774 deaths. So, like I said, the, the context for this is what happened afterwards, and, and the important part of it is, is this development of this surveillance system in 2004. Um, it's the Pneumonia of Unknown Etiology Surveillance System. The idea behind it is that you, you, uh, 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 health officials are monitoring for people who have fever, people who have radiographic evidence of pneumonia, and people who have a reduced or normal leukocyte count or uh, a, lymp a reduced uh, lymphocyte count as well along with lack of improvement from uh, typical antibiotics. So if a person met this criteria and then subsequently was tested for a lot of the typical etiologies for uh, infectious causes of uh, pneumonia, then if those were all negative, this, this would be sent up to the Chinese Ministry of Health for further investigation to determine if there was an epidemiologic link and to see if this was indeed something novel or new. And so this process is actually what, uh, what ended up bringing us into uh, uh, what actually brought us into knowing about uh, the, the current novel coronavirus. Um, yeah, so it, it's really, what would happen is once they had more than two cases like this, that's when, uh, that's when inv more investigations would be begin to occur from the Chinese Ministry of Health. So I want to give just a little bit of, start off with kind of a timeline about what's been happening in the present, moving into the novel coronavirus period. So Wuhan is a very large city, 11 million, I said 11 million people, but it's really 11.8 million people um, in the city. So very, very large city. Um, and what happened on December 18th, uh, one of the first patients was reported, uh, recorded by Chinese officials as having symptoms, and um, they think the case may have started as early as the 1st of December. And what, was ha what happened on the 30th, an urgent public health notice, uh, or an urgent notice for the treatment of pneumonia of unknown uh, cause was issued by the Medical Administration of Wuhan, and uh, 27 people were identified as being likely, uh, likely fitting this definition, and they've had the epidemiologic link of being at this wholesale food market, uh, or seafood market, that was in, in Wuhan City. Um, and that's what happened on the first, is it, that that market ended up being closed. So let me just give a little geographical uh, represent, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of geographical orientation. You can see here, this is the city of Wuhan, and this is its location relative to the remainder of China. This is in the Hubei province. Um, and this is a picture of the, the Wuhan uh, seafood market. Uh, and then as you go in some other pictures inside of it, I think this is probably one of the most illustrative images and something that I think is probably the key effect here is that is we call it a wet market, a market where you have slaughtered animals, live animals, and human contact all in one place. And it's this commingling of animals in, in various states of life or death uh, that increases your risk for exposure to viruses or other, other um other, other infectious causes that might not come together otherwise. And it's sort of, sort of like, well, what ended up being the problematic cause here? What was the link? And it's still being worked on, and we'll talk about that a little bit on later in the presentation, but it's this co-mingling that I think is so important. So, like I said, so and just a, just a little bit more of the kind of the, the geographical importance of Wuhan is so you know it links to the west. You'll have Chengdu to the south. You'll have Guangzhou to the uh, east, and in Shenzhen to the east, you're going to have Nanjing and Shanghai, and to the north, Beijing. So just to kind of give you an idea, this is a it's sort of an intersection between very large cities. So it's, it's a point where um, a lot of human traffic comes through, and certainly gives it a chance to go to other regions throughout uh, throughout China. And I'll also note that in the southern region, uh, you'll have Hong Kong and Macau as well. Um, I know they've, been, they've, 
that they've kind of started to, they're, they're administered differently than the remainder of China being a special administrative regions. So on the 2nd of January, 41 patients were identified as having laboratory confirmed infections and with exposure, uh, or with 27 of them or 66% having exposure to this uh, seafood market. Um, gene sequencing was completed on the 10th of January, uh, and that did show that this virus was, was a member of the coronavirus family, and we'll actually talk about one of those papers here shortly. Um, and then on the 13th, the U.S. did announce, or announced that the genome had been posted to GeneBank um, for review, um, and then the first laboratory confirmed case in the United States was on the 21st of January. Um, Notably, which I think has been probably the thing that's been hitting the news the most, is that Wuhan uh, on the 23rd suspended all, uh, all public transportation, uh, on, basically outbound, inbound, um, their ferry lines, and also cut uh, flights were eventually stopped as well to, mi to hopefully mitigate the spread of the, the virus, or at least that was the intention. Um, I think this is one, one of the things I want to call most attention to is on the 24th, because I think it's a, it's a remarkable feat of human engineering, is that on the 24th there began construction in, in Wu, uh, uh, Wuhan on the, the Ho Shi Shen uh, treatment facility in Wuhan. So that, that was a large-scale 1,000-bed hospital um, that construction was began on, and uh, basically 10 days later they finished it. I just think that that's incredibly remarkable. Um, and on the 26th, China started uh, requiring nationwide use of the monitoring uh, stations for screening, identification, and immediate isolation of the coronavirus. Um, railway stations, bus stations, ports, everything, everything involving human travel was sort of locked down in the sense that very intensive screening was going on. And on the 28th, uh, scientists out of Melbourne were able to actually grow the coronavirus uh, uh, successfully from patient samples. The, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th, and uh, multiple countries began to close off air traffic to China, um, and then the U.S. State Department had advised, advised against all non-essential travel to China. And then the 31st the, is when the, these travel restrictions that went into place on the 2nd of February went into place. So any foreign national coming back from China uh, was, was disallowed based on the, 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 the executive order from the, the Trump administration. Um, and then also any, any American citizen returning from, uh, returning from Hubei province was subject to a mandatory 14-day uh, quarantine. People who are coming back who are from mainland China otherwise who are symptomatic uh, could be placed under a 14-day quarantine. Those who are asymptomatic are, are requested to be under a 14-day home quarantine. And we'll talk about the basis behind this 14-day uh, designation shortly. So moving into just a little bit of some of the papers that have come out very recently, uh, there was a genomic characterization uh, and epidemiology of the coronavirus published out of The Lancet. So this would perform next generation sequencing. Um, they had 10 different viral isolates um, that they were all found to be extremely similar, having 99.98% sequence homology. And then, excuse me, uh, they also found that this vi the, vi the novel coronavirus, when compared to SARS, um, well, actually, excuse me, when compared to some bat coronaviruses, um, uh, sorry, pardon, and so the virus was 88% related to the SARS virus and then was thought to be most closely related to the two coronaviruses that were found in bat species. So thinking that bats may be the original um, uh, host species for the virus, uh, but there may have been another interme intermediary which has not yet been fully, uh, fully defined. Um, and these both fell into the beta coronavirus, uh, beta coronavirus groups. But the most important thing is that this, it did differ enough genetically to be considered distinct from the SARS virus. Uh, there are a few things, I think this next paper actually, yeah. So the next paper talks about uh, some of the things that are similar. So the receptor that, uh, that the novel coronavirus uses to gain entry into the human lung tissue is this angiotensin II uh, converting enzyme receptor inside the lung. So it's the same, it works, or at least it's entering into the human body in a similar mechanism to the way the SARS virus did all the way back in 2002. Um, but otherwise, it is still a distinct virus. Yeah, so let me move on. So I think this is probably one of the more interesting things that came out of the New England Journal um, here a couple of weeks ago, talking about the early transmission dynamics of uh, the, the novel coronavirus. So this uh, paper utilized that pneumonia of unknown etiology surveillance system to be able to determine that these cases were of interest. Um, and basically, if they fulfilled the basic criteria, so fever, the low normal white cell count or low lymphocyte count, and then not improving on antibiotic therapy, um, or if they had a, a contact, had an epidemiologic contact to the to the seafood market along with that, uh, they were thought to be the confirmed cases. What, what happened early on is that these, these patients um, came, into, uh, came in for treatment 
and uh, the kind of their course was monitored. So what I think is important to, to go over here is this, this little graphic. So if you'll pay attention to the, the, the dark orange uh, bars, those are people who had direct linkage to the seafood market. So they're the ones who had, were actually there. The light orange were people who did not have an, a known link to the seafood market. So it, it, this is sort of at least early on suggestive of beginning to have person-to-person -person transmission and not necessarily coming from the original animal or whatever source it was in the market. Um, and then as, as far as time goes, the things to note here is that this early marker here in red was when they actually linked it to that, that, that wholesale market and then uh, the, the virus was actually uh, identified by the Chinese CDC there. And that's, I think that's pointing to right around the 7th or 8th. And then uh, the, the, around the end of it is when the CDC began to publish uh, or, or the Chinese CDC began to um, publish the primers and reagents that were used to evaluate for this virus. Yeah, so looking over some of the demographics of this group, so if you'll notice, it's, a, it's an older group. So age uh, 56, 61 is kind of where uh, the, the, the median ages are falling. Um, but I think one thing that's been talked a lot about is that there weren't a lot of kids here. And, and one, of the, one of the thoughts about this is that, well, why weren't there a lot of kids? And, and it was thought, well, maybe the kids are having somewhat milder symptoms and these old, slightly older adults are having uh, more severe uh, uh, symptoms that are warranting being evaluated to hospital sooner. So I think it's just more so in line with the, the people who are a bit older are getting sicker earlier on and presenting to the hospital sooner than perhaps someone who's younger. So that's one of the limitations of this data is that there's no, re no real young people in this group. Um, and then, but you'll see most of the ages do kind of fall into 45 and up is the age group that's predominantly affected. And then if you look here, and so I will say that the way the graph is divided, or the way the chart is divided up, you'll see it's before January 1st, January 1st to 11th, and then January 12th to the 22nd. Um, as far as the wet market exposure, you'll see that the proportion was much higher earlier on uh, in, in the second epidemic, where, or, or this, excuse me, outbreak, where you have exposure to that market. So as, as time went on, that went down again, suggesting that you're having some human-to-human -human transmission. So as far as some of the, the epidemiologic data on this, they, they had suggested the doubling time for this was 7.4 days, um, and then the estimated r naught was 2.2. Um, for reference, uh, SARS, I think, in, in its beginning was an r naught of 3. Um, and then the duration of illness uh, to first medical visit, so, so that doesn't mean hospitalization, that just means medical visit for 45 patients with the illness before January 1st was estimated to be at a mean of 5.8 days. Um, and it was similar to that of 207 patients uh, with illness onset between the 1st and 11th, so a little bit later on with the mean of 4.6 days. So I think this is probably, so we're, we're, I was mentioning the 14-day quarantine. I think this is part of where this is coming from. I think also uh, other coronaviruses have, have, have sort of had a four, 14 days has been what's been used for other coronaviruses, and at least early on that they sort of, uh, public health officials at the CDC leaned on that 14 days as sort of a, this is what we know about these other viruses, so we'll use that early on, but then the science began to bear out that maybe 14 days is okay. But the, probably the concerning part is that if you look here, there are there's a, there's not a not small proportion of people who do have um, who who do have symptoms for begin after onset greater than that. So it is possible that a person could come in, have been exposed, come into quarantine for 14 days, go out uh, after that 14 days, and then become symptomatic. It's possible, probably not at not a huge number of people, but it's still certainly possible. And then as far as the serial interval, of course, that's a time between successive cases in the chain of transmission or clinical onset to clinical onset. And most of that is beginning to kind of clustering around the seven-day mark uh, that, that you'll, you'll see a sick person contact another person and they become sick. Yeah, the r naught for SARS was around three. And like I said, so it was, it was, the numbers were fairly close but not exactly equal. Um, and like I said previously, again, no, no real cases in children. There are very few cases in children noted in this particular group, this cohort. One interesting thing, that is a piece of correspondence that came out of uh, the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago now, um, was a report of what was thought to be asymptomatic uh, transmission of the virus. But the, the problematic thing is, is that no one actually went back and spoke with the person who was supposed to be transmitting. Um, and they said this person was asymptomatic, and they in fact were not asymptomatic. They were mildly symptomatic. Um, and so it was sort of, it was sort of, she was given, this patient was given this, oh, you're not having any symptoms, but in fact, no one talked to the patient. So there, there had to be a correction and a withdrawal of part of that. Some of the data is still useful. They had some information on, um, had some information on symptom pro progression, but 
the asymptomatic part still not clear exactly if the people are transmitting while asymptomatic. That that's still not hasn't been completely described. Um, so talk about some of the current information as far as like what we're considering a person who's under investigation by the CDC definition. So fever, signs of lower respiratory illness, including cough or shortness of breath and any person who has had contact with a laboratory confirmed case of the 2019 novel coronavirus within 14 days of onset. And then the second part is someone who has, has those symptoms plus known travel to Hubei province within 14 days. Um, the, the latest edition that came on the 31st was this addition of a, a criteria that if you've been to mainland China and you're sick enough to require hospitalization with these symptoms, then you're, you're a person under investigation and are, uh, are can have testing performed at that point. And we'll talk about the testing here in just a little bit. I, 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 pulled, this, uh, I pulled this image off this morning. Uh, this is a great uh, website for tracking some of this information on the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, website. So current case count this morning, it may have changed since I came in here, but 31,523 cases, uh, 638 deaths, and the, they've reported a 1,759 uh, person recovery. As you can see, um, most of this is going to be, co the largest numbers are going to be concentrated in the Hubei province, but there are a lo lot of other cases spreading out around China as well. Um, but that's where that, that very large uh, circle in the middle is, is on Hubei. So this is talking about one of the cases. So we, there, was, there was a lot of media attention when the first case came to uh, Washington State. Um, it was a 35-year-old man who presented to an urgent care clinic in Snohomish County, Washington. He had four days of cough and fevers. Um, and he ended up having, uh, coming into an examination room, waiting around for 20 minutes, um, and then being evaluated. So he had not too much in the way of a medical history. He had some uh, uh, elevated triglycerides. His examination was not the worst. He did have some bronchi or, or just some uh, abnormal breath sounds on examination. Um, and, he, and as far as his labs, he was tested for a battery of viral uh, respiratory pathogens, all of which were negative. Um, the, 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 the Washington State Health Department had close contact with the CDC um, and the patient was uh, stratified to have testing performed and he ended up being positive, uh, as, as, as you might imagine, um, and he ended up being admitted to this Providence Regional Medical Center for clinical observation. Let's see. So, during his course, he had fairly unremarkable course in the earliest days. He was just sort of having oxygen supplementation, um, really was being monitored. But then around hospital day five, um, he began to develop evidence of a radiographic, or radiographic evidence of, uh, of so, so, sorry, so day five he began to have worsening shortness of breath. Then on day six, he began to have radiographic evidence of pneumonia. Um, and what ended up happening is once he started having this increased shortness of breath, increased oxygen requirements, he was treated with typical, well, somewhat typical antimicrobial agents with vancomycin and cefepime uh, for possible uh, secondary pneumonia that may have occurred while he was in the hospital. Um, but then around uh, day six, he got quite a bit worse, and uh, he, you know, compassionate use uh, therapy was sought with this new medicine called remdesivir. Um, this was, it's a novel agent that uh, can, has a basically, uh, it's a nucleoside that kind of messes with the, the, the replication cycle of, of some viruses. That was started on day seven. He did have some improvement on day eight. Was, whether or not that was related to the medicine, not exactly clear, um, but certainly, uh, certainly good for him that he began to improve. Um, and I think that's something that we've seen with this is that people, once you get infected, a lot of the worst part of the illness uh, tends to occur quite a, for a, a good bit of time after the initial infection. So uh, seven, eight days, you may begin to see some clinical deterioration. Um, and I think this was useful talking about some of the symptomatology that the patient w was, ex was experiencing. A cough was the most notable thing being present all the way up until hospital day 15. Fatigue very, very, uh, present through a long course as, as well as uh, fevers, at least uh, 10 days worth of fevers. And then there were a variety of other symptoms that, that came during this process. So I wanted to put this one in here, that this because I think this is fairly important looking at, um, looking at the nasopharyngeal swabs and the oropharyngeal swabs. So that's the sites that we swab, the CDC has asked that, we, that swabs be taken from to determine if a person does indeed have the novel coronavirus. Um, if you notice that for the nasopharyngeal swab, even as far as illness day 12, the patient remained positive for the virus. Um, and then for the oropharyngeal swab, only up to day 11, but perhaps most interestingly is that the stool uh, was actually positive up on day 7, so it wasn't tested prior to that. So it's one of those questions that's left lingering by this, is, is, this, is it possible to transmit this virus through a fecal-oral route? Not fully known yet, but that, that's a question that's out there at the moment. 
Now, as far as the kind of the guidance that's being given from uh, the CDC is we, we use very, whenever we're, so as, as a clinician, whenever we're evaluating patients um, who may, uh, may meet the case definition or, or, or a suspect case, um, we have to take quite a bit of precaution. So the typ typically gloves, gowns, an N95 respiratory mask, which we often, we use most commonly when we're dealing with pathogens like tuberculosis, um, eye shields as well, um, as well as a patient being in a negative pressure room. So it is a, it is quite a, it's a little bit more than a lot of the things that we deal with in the hospital. Sometimes if we're in the hospital and, and it's bacterial causes, it may just be a gown and gloves. So this does go a couple of levels beyond. And not every place has a negative pressure room at their disposal to be able to deal with patients like this. So that, that's something that we have to consider in the public health response is understanding what resources are available in the community. Now, as far as the typical clinical presentation that we see is that, you know, es estimated an incubation period of about five days, um, fever, cough, muscle aches, and fatigue are going to be your most common sets of symptoms. Um, you may have some sore throat early on in the, in the presentation, this, but the, you're, you're sitting here, it's like, doesn't this sound like a lot of other viruses that we have all the time? Yes, it does sound like a lot of viruses that we have a lot of the time. So that's why when we talk to people, when we take calls at the health department, one of the questions we get, well, I, it sounds like I have coronavirus. And the question we ask, well, where have you traveled to? Have you had any travel outside of the country? And that's where we, we've had the chance to be able to reassure people that short of that travel exposure, at least for now, it's very low likelihood that a person would have acquired this particular coronavirus. Um, another thing I want to mention is that we are, there is some severity of illness that can sometimes uh, develop and that's so this ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome is a condition that we see in the hospital not infrequently where a, a person's ability to exchange oxygen in their lungs is severely impaired because of a combination of the effects of the uh, of the virus itself and an immune response against the virus um, it can often require that a person be placed on mechanical ventilation and it can go on to even be as severe as this uh, ECMO ECMO which is a heart, basically a heart lung bypass machine that oxygenates the blood outside of the lungs because the lungs are functioning so poorly that they're not able to fu fully exchange oxygen the way that you need it to. So people can become quite sick with this. So I think a lot of that is occurring and tending to occur in older people, but you know, I think we've seen a lot of the news stories about the, uh, the, the Chinese physician who had uh, alerted people to, uh, or had alerted, alerted his authorities to this early on who had died. So I think he was 34 years old. So you know, obviously these bad effects are not going to be limited to just people who are older. <clears throat> as far as the laboratory findings that we're seeing, we're having a, a leukopenia, leukocytosis, lymphopenia. Um, it's kind of a smattering of, 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 of what, what the white blood cell count may do. Elevations in our liver enzymes or liver function may be impaired. Um, and then also they're showing radiographic evidence of pneumonia. Uh, so one study look out of Lancet showed that about 75% of the patients had, um, who had uh, radiographic imaging that suggested pneumonia actually had uh, pneumo or infiltrates in multiple lobes of the lung, whereas 25% had just in one, one lobe of the lung. And this, so as far as the diagnostic testing, I think this is one of the things that's been very difficult. So uh, that what we've been dealing with locally is that as it stands at this very moment, the CDC continues to be the only people who have access to the test, the only people who are uh, performing the test at the moment. Uh, the FDA, I think, just a couple of days ago, approved some kits that were going to be distributed to uh, local or state health departments for testing. So I'm hoping that begins to happen fairly soon because one of the one of the delays that we've seen is that if we get calls about someone who may be under investigation, uh, what what's happening is calls are going into the CDC and the CDC may take four or six hours to call a person back just because of all the volume of people calling in to say, hey, I may have a patient who may meet the case definition and then having to make a determination. So it's kind of slowed the process down a little bit. Hopefully once these tests are available at the state level, that process can be expedited quite a bit so that we can help, uh, help clinicians make these decisions more rapidly than that are, they're being made right now. So I guess the biggest areas of uncertainty, and there's a lot of areas of uncertainty, this is probably, this is by no means an exhaustive list, is, you know, how long does a person shed a virus? How long is a person truly infectious with the virus? Is there truly asymptomatic uh, uh, transmission of the virus? These are things that, again, still not fully described. Hopefully we're going to be knowing more in the coming weeks. Um, 
And what do we do about treatment? Treatment's one of the things that I know that people have struggled with. I think in, in, in China, a lot of hospitals are giving people a medication called lopinavir, ritonavir. So this is an old HIV medication we've had years and years of experience with, uh, for the most part, very safe, very tolerable. Um, and I think China has started some randomized control trials with that and also that other medicine I miss, mentioned before, remdesivir. So they're going to be looking in to see if these are actually uh, viable treatments. Uh, the data will be forthcoming, hopefully. I, th I think what I read yesterday, a, a, a trial was starting uh, just this week. So hopefully we're going to know something in the near future. Um, but so far, the, the recommendation is that supportive care really is the best option. And what that means is, you know, if a person's oxygen saturation is down, that they're getting oxygen, if they're having acute kidney injury or other organ dysfunction, that we help to manage that the ways that we typically do for other critically ill patients. Um, so I'll close out here really quickly just as a brief mention of what we're doing here in Jefferson County. Um, our disease control staff, we've been fielding questions that come in from providers. We're in close contact with the state in the event that something, uh, someone has a person that they're worried about a lot. We've had a few calls where it's a, a person, they say, well, they, they traveled here, there, elsewhere. It's like, but nowhere near the areas of concern. And so we've had to reassure that short of travel to these really, these areas where we're seeing a large numbers of cases, um, the likelihood is very low. And so a lot of what we've been doing is reassurance at this point. Um, and we've really just been waiting, uh, kind of following the lead from the CDC as far as they're having very frequent updates as far as what their current plans and procedures are. Um, so it, it, it's, it's all developing every day. I, I t tell someone, well, hey, well, what do we do about this? I'm like, I don't know, but maybe tomorrow we'll know. And, that, and I mean that earnestly because um, the, the speed at which we're getting new information is remarkable. And the CDC has been very responsive in helping us with this. So I wish I could speak to you as a professor or as a scientist, say, but that wasn't the case, right? So instead, I'm here just as a relative and friend for many people who are still in China experiencing this uh, outbreak. And I will share some quick, uh, quick uh, slides with you. So actually all the actions could be checked down to February 1st. And so that because say, that was the first time a confirmed case was reported in my home county. So, so that there was a lot of concerns with my families and relatives out there. So I checked the, the, the uh, Johns Hopkins University website to look up for the data. Almost, I mean, already over 12,000 cases reported globally at the time. And that was also the first day that uh, in China, at least, the recovery rate exceeds the mortality rate, right? So that was the good news, right? There is hope that we can cure, not cure, I mean maybe help these patients to recover from the new novel coronavirus infection. And then I got this message from one of my cousins. Because they say the entire country was supposed to take a week-long vacation because of the Chinese Lunar New Year. So everybody was supposed to stay home but she has a job with the county government. So on that day, February 1st, she sent me this message. Hi, bro, I'm going to work, right? And then I look at, at her gloves and I said, well, take care, girl. You are not even wearing the mask correctly. <laughs> well, so I spent a few minutes, okay, trying to find the picture, okay, how you, you're going to wear those masks. And she's like, well, she has a mask, but other, people's, well, other people in the county don't have any, right? So that's, and then I checked again, okay, even for the health workers in the hospitals, right? They are treating those patients. Look at those nurses. They are making their own masks. And then you will see this, and it is here using the shopping bags as shoe covers. And then I realized, oh yes, there was really a problem, right? So what can we do about this kind of issue? Now, just to give you an orientation, right? Wuhan is here, right? That's the epicenter of this new coronavirus again. Changsha is the capital city of Hunan province. I'm from Hunan, right? 
sun size capacity. That distance is about 217 miles, 1.5 hours away by high speed train. My, my hometown is somewhere here in a place called Saoyang, right? Uh, Saoyang. So, so basically my parents and most of my relatives are docking in the area right now because they don't have any masks, so they cannot leave the home. Fortunately, they have enough grocery. And so on that day, I checked the numbers for my home province. 389 confirmed cases, including one from my home county. Eight of these patients had already recovered. The recovery rate was 2.1%. That's the number we are concerned with because if the patients are not leaving the hospital and the physicians and nurses need to take care of so many patients at the same time, that is the risk, right? So if they get exhausted and if we don't take care of them, I think that uh, the situation will definitely get worse. That's when I decided to ask for pictures, okay? There, so the, all the reactions that you have seen in the news, for example, right? They focus on Wuhan, on Hubei province, and so on major hospitals. Now, they are 14 time zones away from us. It seems remote, but for me, they are just one click away from my cell phone. So I can, I can get pictures, right? This is a community health center in Changsha, which is the capital city, right? You will see this built. Oh, excuse me. That's the building here, several stories. That's the main entrance. This is the station for the triage. They will tell whether patients have fever or not fever, right? He's wearing a mask, no gloves. You have another station. They have masks. They are wearing those uh, grocery gloves, transparent ones, okay? He is trying to uh, take some medical records here, okay? They are trying to disinfect the uh, floors, and she's the only one running the lab. She's the only one I can tell wearing the gloves properly, wearing red, red gloves. So those are the healthcare workers right now, okay? So they are expecting sick patients walk in the clinic because there are so many cities being locked down. All the public transport has been shut down. So they can only go to the community health care centers <coughs> if they have any illnesses, for example, right? Because that's within walking distance. So that's how they deal with the situation. And so that's when I decided to give an interview with the uh, ABC 3340. I, I have a former postdoc, Dr. Ruby Ni. She graduated from a medical school in China, in Changsha, actually. So she has a lot of friends who are working at the hospitals treating the new coronavirus infected patients. So she shared a lot of pictures with me and said, okay, yeah, it's true. They are really in short of supplies. And therefore, we reviewed all the main uh, events, right? I mean, what's going on right now in terms of the infection control, we need to diagnose those patients promptly. So that's not an issue. They have the real-time PCR kits, and so the they, they, uh, tests are highly sensitive and specific. Quarantine in the community, say they are supposed to stay at home, so that's fine. In the hospital, they have uh, designated areas for, and they also build up two new hospitals. But even with those two new hospitals, they, the capacity is, uh, is only about 3,000. What about the other 27,000 patients, right? Treatment. This, okay, so I mentioned that uh, for the healthcare workers, they don't have enough PPE, they, uh, they have personal protective equipment, and those hospitals, they are overcrowded, and they are no specific meds, as uh, Wes has already mentioned. Now, there are some experimental medicines being tested, right? And uh, some of them seem to be uh, effective. And then with a the new trial going on in China, maybe we'll get some results. But they estimate they will get results probably in, 80, in April. So we will not know the results until <coughs> April. So if you hear any news saying, okay, oh yes, we have a cure, no, they don't. 
the earliest possible day they will know the results for this trial would be, I think it's uh, on the 7th of April, right? So a lot of the folks here are like, oh, don't worry, because if you compare with the influenza, I mean, we have, I mean, it's, it's probably, the, the uh, mortality rate is probably even higher than, than 3%, but I want to caution them because they look at the recovery rate as of today, okay? It's very low recovery rate, which means the patients are not being discharged from the hospitals, and that can tie up a lot of resources, and we are already short of that, right? So what can we do here in terms of assistance? I know we have a lot of uh, talented scientists and physicians in this community. There are a lot of primary data already published online, Lancet, New England General Medicine, Bio Archive, right? Maybe you can look into the primary data and then find some clues for patient care, or you can offer some treatment options, right? And so the other thing is that uh, maybe we can consider some uh, humanitarian donations to specific areas, and that's what I've been doing uh, through uh, uh, ABC 3340 and some other organizations, right? So this is the key start from today, February 7th. In China, over 31,000 confirmed, more than 26,000 suspected, 631, 37, sorry, 637 deaths, and 17,000, sorry, 1,753 patients recovered. So that recovery rate is 5.6. It's better now, but it's still way below the optimum. So only 5.6% of the patients have recovered. So in the past two months. So that's horrible, right? Now you notice that, okay, this map here is shown in black because the entire nation is, is uh, mourning that first physician who reported this outbreak in Wuhan. He was accused of spreading rumor, but eventually, right, he was the one who actually uh, was the first whistleblower. And so he died yesterday, and the entire nation okay, is uh, remembering his brief, um, his bravery and, and, and his courage in, in dealing with the new situation, because this is something new, right? There is always a steep learning curve. There's also a price to pay. We expect that, right? So what I'm asking, okay, so can we do something here that can uh, help them out? I know those physicians, they are exhausted. You see that? This is how they sleep. They are wearing these raincoats as the PPE, right? I don't want to show you this video because it can be disturbing to many people. Now they have mobilized some military medical crew to them. She happens to have a daughter, right? She knows, okay, she's going to the front line. And so, 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 so there's that kind of thing is happening right now, every day, right? So uh, there are a lot of physicians, nurses, and the supporting staff dealing with thousands of patients in certain areas, in certain hospitals, and there is a risk of further spread of this outbreak. Now, there is hope, right? We know that humans have the resources and wisdom to deal with any emergency or any kind of uh, epidemics. It's just, it's just a matter of time. We need to deliver some help to those individuals, and that's my first priority. Yesterday, there was a shipment from San Francisco to Wuhan, and so, so that I know these people. And then, in the meantime, okay, so let me see if I can get this video. Face mask. Your face mask. So, so, so this gentleman, right? This gentleman is using some plastics, okay, cover his face as a mask. You know now that, right, there is still a shortage of those essential supplies. And 
So that's why I've been trying to, 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 to talk to uh, independent hospitals and clinics to see if they have any surplus that we can ship right away. So that's what I've been doing for the whole week. Unfortunately, all the air traffic has stopped, either stopped or jammed. I have tons of stuff now, but I cannot ship out. I have goggles, I have N95 masks, I have shoe covers. They are all in San Francisco, but I cannot ship them out, okay? So FedEx, no way. USPS, no way. Uh, UPS, no way. They, there's only one Chinese airline operating out of the entire California, well, actually out of the, yeah, out of the entire West Coast, South China Airline. It has a lot of ties with my home county, okay? Remember that, South, Air, South China Airline. They are the only ones still keeping this air channel open so that some of the much needed <coughs> essential supplies can, be, can be still be delivered to the hospitals where they need most. And for that, I really appreciate the, the, the uh, efforts. And I'll stop here and also thank uh, Dean Irwin for organizing this opportunity and Dr. Shrestha, of course, for, for, for uh, getting this, setting up uh, this uh, special seminar. Mm -hmm.